Hi, welcome to Fort Collins Bible Church Wednesday evening service. It's uh, so nice to have you here and, and share the little bit of digital fellowship that we can. We have an exciting time tonight where we're going to sing praises, we're going to lift up and cast our anxieties on the Lord and, and uh, the Lord in prayer together. We're going to have some announcements and um, finally we will of course continue our in-depth study of Psalm 23 and looking at our relationship to the Lord who is our shepherd. Glad you're here. Let's open our time with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we praise you and we thank you for this time, the ability for us to share fellowship even over distances. Father, we do pray for all of the difficulties and challenges that this quarantine is bringing. We pray that you continue to lead us and guide us through this time that we might always have our gaze fixed upon you. In the matchless name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. And now will you join me in saying, Jordan's Stormy Banks. Praise the Lord together, even under these strange circumstances. Well, we have a few announcements that I'd like to make you aware of before we go to the Lord in prayer. First of all, just tomorrow, tomorrow evening, Thursday night at 7.30 on Facebook and YouTube, we're going to get to study scripture with Sam, which will be a lot of fun. And then maybe one day we'll be able to get Ben and then we can uh, study the Bible with Ben. But anyway, tomorrow is studying scripture with Sam, and we're very much looking forward to, uh, to that time. So just tune in online at uh, 7.30. We'll send out links if, uh, and, and so forth like we've done in the past. But we'd love to see you join us for that study. Another great opportunity to learn uh, learn the Word of God from a very skilled and, and apt teacher. It'll be a lot of fun. Um, other announcements. Next week is Holy Week, and we have the opportunity available to us, especially if you're one of those who's unable to go into work at this time or unable to get out of your house. DM2 is doing an exciting um conference online. So it's an online conference. I believe it'll be done on Zoom, but whatever the case, just go to the DM2 website and um, 
and click register and you'll get online materials that you can print out if you want to or you can just uh, follow along with the online manual. We've got 40 teachers from around the globe. Many of the people that you know and have heard of have come through Fort Collins Bible Church. So it's a great, great chance to, uh, to see uh, some wonderful teachers of God's Word and really have a phenomenal experience, particularly appropriately on, on Holy Week. So uh, go ahead and get registered or ask uh, around if you need help getting registered for that. It should be a lot of fun. Also, our uh, Thursday evening Seder will obviously be canceled. We won't uh, won't do that, um, and I can't really think of a good way to do an online version of that other than we'll post a link to that. So we'll probably just have Scripture with Sam again on Thursdays as normal um, uh, for, for Monday Thursday, and then Good Friday we'll have a short online service that'll be like our usual online service, a sort of reflective, you know, meditative, we'll sing the, the beautiful hymns of the cross and we'll consider the accounts uh, that lead us to the cross and tell us about the meaning of the cross and uh, be in prayer together so if you'd like to set that time aside probably again 7 30 on friday night so next week of course next week on good friday we look forward to seeing you there now as it comes to our, our prayer requests, obviously our largest prayer concern is the fact that we lost Joel this week. He um, went to home to be with the Lord, and that is just tragic. It's heartbreaking to all of us, and we're all feeling that loss, and particularly um, Sheila and Josh and Courtney at this time are experiencing that loss. And of course, as anyone knows, once you lose a loved one, there's uh, things that need to be done and decisions that need to be made and so on and so forth. So uh, we have no information about service yet. We won't until such time as as the the quarantine is lifted or changes its restrictions. Um, But we'll make it very plain when that happens. We will be doing a uh, recognition and um, some memorial efforts in our Sunday morning service, so please join us for that so we can at least have that uh, reflection of the wonderful and godly life that Joel lived. So we'll uh, be praying for that and for the Cromley family. We'll also be praying for the various situations that and and extra situations we know we have people surrounding the church we're in the medical field we have the the carmens are in the middle of their own personal health crisis that's uh, not covid related but has been impacted by all this covid um, business so please pray for all of our our medical workers and those basic uh, basic needs that of truckers and delivery drivers and all those around. Um, Please pray for those who are in isolation and those who are sick. I'll give you now uh, some silent moments to pray and then I'll I'll close us in prayer after such time as we're through. Heavenly Father, we come to you with heavy hearts, having sustained a great loss. A brother in the Lord, a friend, a leader, a Bible teacher, a servant, and who's so many things, also a husband and a father and a grandfather. Lord, as we mourn the loss of Joel, we recognize and remember that he is happier, fuller, more whole now than he has ever been. Lord, and that it is not with regret that he looks back on this transition into glory. But Father, for those of us here who suffer, those of us here who need now to rely on one another all the more in his absence, we uh, pray. We pray for comfort and encouragement in this time. We pray for peace for all those who are experiencing loss in our church, around our community, and especially in Joel's family. Lord, as we continue to consider all the other dif- difficult and dangerous situations, we praise you for all of those medical workers like Shauna and others who are uh, putting themselves at great personal risk, nurses, doctors, orderlies, um, Father, people who are doing all the basic tests, phlebotomists and ultrasound techs, and Lord, all those who are serving you in this time, we pray that you would protect them from infection and enable them to continue to serve in this way. Lord, in this time, we also pray for those who are isolated and alone. Father, we pray for those who are impacted just simply by not being able to um, get out of their house after basic needs. Lord, we pray for those who are in financial hardship in this time. Please administer each uh, to each of them. 
Father, we also pray for those in the leadership positions in our country, or both state, local, and uh, nationally, and around the world. Father, please give the leaders of this country and this world uh, wisdom to deal with this crisis appropriately and wisely. And Father, most of all, might this crisis be a time that draws each of us closer to you and trust and in reliance upon your care and upon your guidance and in comfort, the comfort of knowing that you have a plan. And may it make others open and aware of all that you've given and done for all of us. Might one more and one more come into your saving embrace in this time. In the matchless name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. All right, now we will uh, let you settle down and get, prepare yourself for our scripture reading. Our scripture reading for this evening is Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff. They comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Well, here we are, getting to move on in our study of Psalm 23. I hope you've enjoyed this study. It, it is such a uplifting chapter of the Bible and so familiar to us. And it's interesting because we can oftentimes overlook those most familiar passages of the Bible as if they're, you know, too mainstream. We can kind of become spiritual hipsters and like, oh, I just, I only want to know the want to know the stuff that nobody else knows. But these uh, important and well-known passages are important and well-known for a reason, and that's that they, uh, they're they very uh, valuable and they carry great spiritual treasures. So I think it's valuable for me, I know, to, to take a step back and look at these passages together. So to recap, we are dealing with the author here, and the author here is David. The author of this specific psalm had been a shepherd, as we saw, that he was also a king over Israel. He was chosen by the Lord for that purpose, to be uh, to be the ruler over Israel and also to be the recipient of the Davidic covenant. He was a man after God's own heart. So we can learn a great deal of what it means to pursue the Lord as we study these wonderful words. Um, we saw that in the, our first study that it's the Lord, it's Jehovah God, it's the covenant name of God. And notice that David calls God by this covenant name. He uses that personal name to talk to God. Isn't that cool? I think that is worth, uh, worth and a value for us to, to copy, right? To recognize that the Lord has taken us and, and taken us into his uh, fellowship and into his counsels in a very personal and intimate way that would be absolutely blasphemous if he hadn't uh, said it himself, if he hadn't himself uh, won the right for us to be here. Um, so the Lord is personally David's shepherd. And so this is a nature of the relationship that's being discussed, right? The nature of this relationship that God has with you is that he calls himself your good shepherd, as Christ said in the Gospel of John. And so that's the parallel that we're constantly playing off of. I want to note that um, when we're reading the Old Testament, and particularly the Psalms, we don't, we can't necessarily take all the Psalms as being a one-to-one. -one. They were written in the context of the nation of Israel. They were written certainly on the basis of a relationship with God, which we also had, but it's not the same relationship with God. They were God's earthly people. They were given specific promises and, and uh, of, of physical and earthly blessing for their obedience and physical judgment for their disobedience. And that does not carry over to the church. In fact, quite to the contrary, we are promised that we will have tribulation while we're in this world 
when we're success, when we are uh, successfully walking with the Lord, when we are growing, when we are in the right place, which is different, uh, differs greatly from God's set of promises to Israel. We also have a position in Christ that they didn't have, and the Holy Spirit within us operating and ministering in, in unique ways that they didn't have. So we want to note that there's differences uh, between the position of the psalmist. However, we can see that we can always read and be edified by the psalms because they are about relationship with the living God. They tell us about God's character. They tell us about God's plan. But in this specific case, because Jesus Christ is the good shepherd and said that we are sheep from his sheepfold, we can draw even more uh, kind of deeper or closer parallels between our walk and David's because of the nature that uh, of God's shepherd relationship with all of his people, be they from uh, Israel or from the church. So um, we will also note uh, the next statement that he will uh, not be in a permanent state of want, that he knows that want or need or lack will not be the permanent state of David's uh, soul because his shepherd, while he might bring us through difficult times and challenges that bring heartache, difficulty, pain, loss, uh, the, the knowledge that we're not enough, that our resources are, are failing, right, even to starvation, health loss, and, and the like, um, that that will not be the permanent state of our soul. And even those um, in this current situation that we're in, the knowledge that um, our dear friend and Deacon Joel, who we just lost, will never again know want for his soul, right? There, was, there were times of great want um, that were not forever. They were short and limited time, and we'll experience those short and limited times, but the ultimate reality is that the shepherd of our souls will see us through to a place where we are ultimately fulfilled, full, and whole in Christ. And then last week's study, we saw that the shepherd cares for, guides, and feeds, and waters us as the flock. Right? And then we saw that that's the job of the shepherd. So when the Lord decides that he's going to call himself my shepherd and your shepherd, he's going to call himself the good shepherd, he's taking responsibility for a great deal over us. Right? If the, the flock gets sick, if the flock goes missing, it's not the flock's fault, it's the shepherd's fault. If the wolves attack, it's not the flock's fault, it's the shepherd's fault. So when God takes this level of responsibility, then we need to take that very, very seriously and understand what it means to be a sheep under his marvelous care. So today we continue on, pardon me, stuffy nose. I'd like to read us all the way up to verse three. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. So this uh, evening, we get to look at this these great statements. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. So this will be our, our focus today. So we want to first notice that he says the, uh, the soul of me, right, or the Again, this wonderful, compact nature of Hebrew has this all in one word, but uh, the soul of me. Now, I want to note what the soul is. It's kind of difficult, or we can oftentimes uh, get confused by what these uh, these words mean. You know, soul and heart and spirit and guts and all those other uh, words that we mind and, and such like. But uh, we note that there is a physical world and there is a spiritual world. Both worlds are real right? We sometimes misuse uh, this idea of the real world and mean the physical world. Um, but the f- physical world and the spiritual world together are the real world or reality as God has intended it. And as human beings, we have been given a place bet- uh, that of existing in both the physical world and the, the human world. I think uh, the, the spiritual world, rather. The physical world and the spiritual world the seen and the unseen are um, constantly a part of what it is to be a human, right? And it's also what distinguishes um, us from the rest of animal creation. They might have um, souls, but they don't have spirits. They don't have uh, a, a standing in the spiritual world. They only have a standing, the animals, in the physical world. It appears to us from scripture. However, we might look at, so we might look at our lives uh, with this diagram and see that it, our body, or we have, if you like, a, a, a line in between the physical and the spiritual. And on the physical side, we have a casing, if you like, that allows us to interact with the physical world, our body, right? And on the spiritual side, we have a casing or, you know, a, yeah, that, that 
that um, allows us to interact with the spiritual world, and that is our spirit, right? We see that both our physical body and our spirit have senses or yeah, facilities, if we like, capabilities, have senses. We talk about, you know, blindness, and the Lord talks about spiritual blindness. We have uh, t- spiritually tasting to see if the Lord is good. We have uh, physical taste and as an analog. So we see that our physical senses have a spiritual analog. So as we're interacting with the physical world, we're also constantly interacting with the spiritual world, particularly uh, through the Word. And their soul is in the middle. Our soul uh, seems to have, you know, the be the uniting me factor or feature. So there's a lot of discussion as to whether the man is bipartite or tripartite. Are we are we just body and soul, or are we body, soul, and spirit? And the answer, I believe, is yes, we are. A with, uh, sometimes in scripture, spirit or soul is used to describe the entire immaterial part of man, and at other times, um, they they have their own nuance of meaning. The spirit being again our facility, our ability to interact with the spiritual world by God's design, and our soul being the the part of you that is you, if you like, the part of you that is you. Um, there will be a point as a, a believer, if you were to, are to pass away, that you depart from this body and later you'll be given a new body. That is to say that it's not as if we are looking to escape these physical bodies and never see a physical body again, we find that God designed humanity to be body, soul, and spirit, and that those to work together in a certain fashion. And if there is a time where a body, a, a, a person, a, a saint is apart from his physical body, uh, and there's different arguments about how the Lord will deal with this. Do we remain disembodied until we receive our new body? Do we receive our new body right away? Is there some sort of intermediary body? Which it's, uh, scripture is not clear. But what is clear is that you're designed to and will ultimately always, uh, you know, in the long term, have a body, whether it's your old current body or your new body that is yet prepared for you or being prepared for you. Um, but this is the soul. So this is the the me part, if you like, that uh, that... David has in view here. And it's, so that's that's the immaterial part of him that that you that you that gives you self-consciousness, if you like, is what David has in control. And what does he say? He says that the Lord is restoring. So the soul of me, the Lord is restoring. Now, restore means to obviously bring something back to its right or original condition. So we think about, you know, a great, uh, beautiful painting that has faded over the years. If you get to see, you know, the, the Last Supper, Supper or the Mona Lisa or, or any of the great paintings, you can notice that they're not as crisp, not as fresh as different prints of it you might have seen because they're very, very old. And they're wonderfully skilled and talented people who do nothing but restore the paintings and make sure that those paintings, as they decay in age, that they're brought brought back to their, as close to their original condition as we can. But the word itself means here to turn around or bring back. That's the, the literal word that we've got translated restore means to, to, to bring it back or re- return it uh, to, in this case, its right position. Um, and this is in the imperfect tense. We've noticed this with a lot of these verbs. What is David talking about? He's not really talking about positional realities, in, except for when he said, "What the Lord is my shepherd. Um, but he's talking about things that are going on in his day-to-day life. Uh, he's talking about how the Lord is constantly feeding him, constantly allowing him to rest, constantly is continually um, at the under the shepherd's care and provision. Right? And so here we see, that this restoration is imperfect. It's it's a continuing action of the Lord. Now that's worth noticing, I think. We want to see that the Lord will be constantly restoring us as believers. David was a, a good dude for sure. And particularly at the point of his life when he wrote this, um, we would see that, call it kind of the spiritual heights. He'd have some trouble later on, but he was very faithful to the Lord and demonstrably faithful. And even then he talks about this need for constant restoration. And I want to note that that is valuable for us. I think we sometimes get this weird idea of perfection or of maturity that it means being finished. It means being done. It means completing something in the sense of like, done that, did it, now I'm perfect forever. But that's not the way that the Lord seems to have designed space and time and not designed a relationship, particularly our relationship with him. Eating, as we saw last week, we have to do it daily. We can't just eat one meal and be done. We have to constantly go back and eat again every day. We're dependent upon that. Breathing, last breath that you had, only 
satisfies you only enables you to live until you need your next one, right? Drinking, you must hydrate daily or regularly. Our, shep- our shepherd knows this and provides us with calm water, or calm waters, as we saw. And now restoration. We constantly need to be brought back and restored. It's the statement of it's a statement of the shepherd's constant care. It's a statement of moment by moment soul care that the Lord is pouring out or is is doing in your life. He is the actor. Note, um, it's not based upon us and our response. It says that He is constantly restoring the sheep's uh, us as the sheep or David as the sheep in this case. And it brings an interesting uh, observation that. Uh, um, Philip Keller pointed out in his wonderful book, and we referenced this last week. I'll even pull it out for you here. Um, a, a shepherd looks at Psalm 23. He points out that uh, sheep, because of how they're built, especially if they get too much wool or become too much overweight, that they will become what is called cast. And basically what this is, and I've, uh, I've seen footage of this, but a, a sheep can essentially be sat onto its back, you know, lay down and lay down too much and then somehow be turned to its back if the wool is too thick and be unable to right itself. And if that that sheep that is cast is not restored uh, for too long, different gases build up in its digestive system because it's not designed to live on its back and it will bloat up in the, those gases and the sheep will die. So the sheep must be restored. So this is powerful picture of, uh, f- and he, he fills out the metaphor uh, very well in pointing out that as the sheep get cast, they get cast because they're uh, overweight or, or over wooled, I guess we would say. And being overweight or over wooled is not a total, totally bad parallel to uh, being, be being walking in falseness or dis- disobeying disregarding the lord or walking even by the by the flesh right walking in sin and thus we can become cast and we need the lord to come and restore us to turn us over again and in fact what we find is that a cast sheep you didn't just flip it over real fast and like going around kicking all these sheep over bing, 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 and they're all back again and they're fine, you know, because you kicked them all real fast. But uh, the way in which this process is described is that you have to slowly, gently turn them back over, sometimes rubbing life back into their limbs and preparing them to stand up and sitting with them. It's a, it is a process. And again, it's a, a constant um, need is for this restoration. And I wanted to consider uh, in light of this, another favorite passage, John 15, one through four. He says, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Each branch in me that does not bear fruit, he raises up or lifts up is the uh, literal translation there and every branch that bears fruit he prunes that he may bear more fruit you are already clean because of the word which i have spoken to you abide in me and i in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine neither can you unless you abide in me you see this moment by moment care picture here we're constantly related to jesus christ as the vine as the source of our very uh, spiritual life and the Father is the vine dresser. He's the one who is going to cultivate us. And so when we're not bearing fruit, what does he do? He raises us up. And this is a common practice in, in first century vintnering, where you would take the unproductive vine and you'd lift it up and you'd tie it to your trellis or to your support so that it could get the right amount of light or whatever it was that was missing and to keep it in position to bear fruit, right? And he says that every fruit that, fruit that bears fruit, he prunes. So in other words, as you're growing um, grapes, you can not just let every single cluster that appears grow because that that um, that means that the nutrition that comes through the vine will be too broadly dispersed. If you want to get really good grapes, then you pluck up, just like if you want a really big pumpkin for that matter, you pluck off all of the less healthy uh, shoots so that the, the shoots that you want to bear good grapes are available and, and will come and, and receive all the nourishment. None of it will be wasted on non-essential or non-fruitful effort. And so here is a picture of our fruitfulness and how it is related entirely to the Lord Jesus Christ, the work of God the Father. Um, we could argue, if, if you're willing to extend the metaphor to the Holy Spirit being that sap um, that enters into us, then, then the entire Trinity is the source of your fruitfulness and my fruitfulness. Isn't that something? I think that's a picture here of, uh, or a a beautiful parallel to what uh, David is saying here when he says that the Lord, um, 
makes him lie down in green pastures, leads him beside quiet waters, and is constantly and regularly restoring our soul. So we would ask, how does the Lord restore our souls today? We know he does it, right? You know that he is constantly uh, restoring us and he's constantly bringing us, uh, bring us back, refreshing us, we might say, um, and, and calling us back when we get out of line. But I would like to give you some more practical ways in which the Lord restores our souls uh, on a daily basis. And uh, this is not exhaustive. It's just as I prayed and thought about this passage, what came up. First of all, he, uh, we're going to focus on three major ways in which the Lord restores us through the ministries of the Holy Spirit, through the ministries of the Word of God, and through the ministries of the body of Christ, right? And again, this is uh, woefully paltry, but I wanted to give you some practical ways in which this happens, even if they're not exhaustive. So the ministries of the Holy Spirit, He restores us by convicting us of sin. When we're out of line, when we're thinking wrong, when we behaved wrongly, the Holy Spirit will let us know that we're out of line. The Holy Spirit will affect us and show us that we are, uh, and make us uneasy, right? I'm sure you've all had this experience where you do something and then you do something that you know uh, was wrong, or maybe you thought it might be okay, but then as time goes on, you think, you know, I wonder if what I said was really spiteful or mean or unnecessary or so on. So then you go to that person, or maybe you do the worst thing and you, you like go try to judge justify yourself to someone else and then you know even though they're a good friend and so they say yeah oh yeah absolutely you were totally right because they don't have all the information but what they really don't have is that information of the holy spirit that's convicting you and making you try to justify yourself right but the holy spirit will not let us uh, continue to live apart from the lord it's going to continue to convict us of wrong thinking of wrong actions of, of things that lead us away from him Next, we have the comforting ministry of the Holy Spirit. When we're in sorrow, when we're in pain, when we're in loss, we, we find that that can get us cast and we need restoration. And so he restores us by comforting us through the Holy Spirit, by bringing scripture to mind, by uh, bringing songs to mind. We get that peace as we cast our cares on him, that peace that passes understanding. That is to say, a supernatural peace coming from his spirit, even when we don't know what's bringing it. It is always wonderful and I, and I don't mean to say this, it is always a wonderful byproduct of seeing believers struggle because the peace of God within them is always such an encouragement. Um, we see this with our brothers and sisters around when they suffer and when the moment when they're truly abiding in Christ and we say, how can you do that? How can you suffer in the way that you're suffering? How can you struggle in the way that you're struggling and still uh, keep that smile on your face? How can you still press on in hope and with confidence? And the answer is they can't. It's the Lord Jesus Christ working in them. It's the Holy Spirit's ministry of comfort. So the next way in which the Holy Spirit restores us is he encourages us. He encourages us when we're frightened. He encourages us uh, and gives us a sense, and that really, the the etymological definition of encourage. He infuses courage within us to speak the truth when we're frightened, when we're scared of whether it's of the virus or the world situation or of war. Or of, he encourages us constantly and keeps us um, encouraged as we are uh, reliant upon him, as we're rightly related to him. Um, and uh, finally for today, he teaches us and illumines us, which will lead into the next ministry, the ministry of the word. But the Holy Spirit is critical in your understanding. Yes, I am teaching you the Bible right now. And the Holy Spirit is operating in me to do that. And you are learning the Bible right now. And the Holy Spirit is operating in you to take in the truth of the word of God and code it and let it change the way you think, the way you view, the way that you um, act in everyday life, right? So it's the Holy Spirit that is doing that. He's the one who teaches you, the one who illumines you in these ways. Now, so the Lord uh, encourages or restores us, rather, through the ministries of the Holy Spirit, which are far more than we've mentioned now, through the ministries of the word, ministry of the Word. Um, the Word of God, the Bible, is constantly a, a source or a tool in the hand of our shepherd to restore us uh, to him and to continue to restore us to our right place. It reminds us of our position in Jesus Christ. Last week we got to look with some... Uh, or is it two weeks ago? Anyway, we got to look with some depth at, depth at what the Lord has given us in our position in Christ Jesus, what it means to be uh, dead to the world, dead to sin, and alive to God through Jesus Christ, what it means to be separated from those things, the principle of law, the worldly principle of slavery to sin, is, is from 
the slavery to the enemy. Um, the Word of God reminds us that even though we will have different conditional experiences, we'll have failures, we'll have heartaches, we'll have losses, that we have a position in Christ that is unlosable, that is permanent, that is whole, because it's based on what He's done, not based on what we've done. Next, we find the, the Word reveals our destiny. And how critical is this? How important it is to understand, and this is why I think the the church is flagging in many areas, because the church has failed to teach the prophetic truth about the future in the Word of God. And because we have taken our eyes off of heaven, because we have taken our eyes off of our hope, and because we've taken our eyes off the blessed hope of Christ's return and of all of his plan for the future, we have become complacent and worldly very frequently, because if there's no heaven, or if we're not focused on heaven, then we're just going to live for what's on earth, right? And so it's the Bible that tells us and reveals our destiny and gives us that opportunity to do and act and live in light for where, of where the Lord is actually leading us and guiding us. The next, uh, we see that the Bible t tells us about our divine resources. We very much are like that um, that sad story. <laughs> and the story goes that a man was... Uh, wanted to get to America from, you know, the United Kingdom. And he wanted to get to America. He thought there was his only hope was to get to America, but he, he couldn't afford it. He was very poor. So he saved up and saved up and saved up. And in order to save money, he knew he could just afford the ticket. And what he did, instead of um, eating the food on the ship to save just a little bit more money, he'd buy the ticket and he'd, he'd eat these, he found this very dry, hard cheese and these crackers that wouldn't go stale for the several week long journey. And so here he is, Got it, finally bought his ticket. He's got his suitcase and his extra suitcase full of cheese and crackers. And throughout the whole time, he's, he's, he's just so thankful that he's going to get to go to America, that he was able to save up enough money. And he listens and he hears the clanking of dishes and the, the wonderful, delicious feast that's being laid out for everyone. And he says it's worth it as he eats his cheese and crackers. And until the last day, uh, the last day of the, uh, the journey, Someone comes up to him and says, I notice each night when we eat in the in the galley where we, we're all being fed, you sit out here and um, eat your cheese and crackers. Is that for religious reasons? What's going on? He says, oh, I am very poor and I can't afford anything. I could only afford the price of the ticket. And so I was eating these cheese and crackers in order to sustain myself and get through because I so badly want to go to America. And the person said, with some embarrassment, don't you know the price of your meals is included in the ticket price you could have been eating with us the whole time it's a sad analogy but it's quite apropos because it perfectly describes the fact that you have been given everything that you need for life and godliness in christ jesus and we just leave it on the shelf he's given us all these divine resources we're forgiven, we're, um, we're redeemed, we're bought back, we're bought with a price. We've been given the Holy Spirit to work in and through us. We've been given everything that we need for life and godliness. And it's in the Word of God that we find out where our divine resources are and how we're meant to utilize them to, uh, to live the life which God designed us to live. Right? That's a process. And that's how the Lord restores us, is by bringing us back constantly to understand what He's given us in His Son, Jesus Christ. Next, uh, we find that the Bible uh, gives us divine perspective. It's so easy to just get caught between about here and here and be so wrapped up in your own head and your own circumstances and your own what people think of you or what's going on in your life or what are you going to do? What am I going to do next? What about me? And the Bible gives us that divine perspective of saying the, Holy, the Lord God, our shepherd, will watch over us. And we can be concerned with him rather than concerned with ourselves. So it gives us that divine perspective that this is all a part of God's plan, that we exist to his glory, and that's the purpose. Um, and the final way, so we have that he restores us through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. He restores us through the ministries of his word. He restores us through the ministries of the body of Christ. We are meant to be. We're designed to be. There might be situations and exceptions where we're not, but we are meant to, and designed to be in constant fellowship and communion with other people in the church. We use our gifts to edify one another, right? You are meant to use your spiritual gifts to build up others, whether that's gifts of teaching, of mercy, of 
of service, of helps, of administration. You're meant to use that with this sole purpose of building up the body of Christ. <laughs> Sorry, it's cold, just won't let go. Um, we're meant to pray for one another. We are meant to come and, and act as uh, in a, our priestly office by praying up and lifting up one another's requests in prayer and needs in prayer. We are meant to comfort one another because we have been comforted. So as we have been comforted by the Holy Spirit, it is God's design that we would then take that and comfort others and the, those experiences of the Lord's um, sufficiency and goodness and love and share that with others and comfort others. And finally, we, rest we are restored by God when the body of Christ corrects, teaches, and exhorts uh, one another. That's part of the Lord's restoration plan for us. He restores us regularly through the body of Christ when we teach the word, when we exhort one another, when we see that a brother or sister is thinking wrongly or their thinking is messed up or their uh, actions are out of line with God's character and we lovingly um, correct and exhort, exhort them to uh, live in a way that is more consistent with their position in Christ. The Lord restores our souls. That's powerful. And the interesting thing is, is that I think a lot of the time we'll go out of our way to try to become cast sheep. And that's less than uh, we would hope for ourselves. But the, the shepherd is good. The shepherd is faithful. And he continues to, through these uh, ministries and others, uh, restore us. But he certainly restores us through the ministry of his Holy Spirit, through the ministry of his word, and through the ministry of the church or the body of Christ. So now we'll go on to our second to last little phrase or clause here. He leads me in paths of righteousness. Now, again, we, uh, most of us with some significant exceptions don't have a lot of sheep, but uh, being a shepherd in the first century, as we've seen, was even different to how we would do it, do things today based on resources and of various kinds and landscape. But in the first century world of Israel, or sorry, first century, goodness gracious, um, in the time that David's writing, about 1000 BC, the, in Israel we'd find that the most of the year, and particularly in the, uh, in the summer months, you would, run, you would be taking your sheep, your flock of sheep as a shepherd, up into the hills, right? You take them up to a higher elevation where it's cooler, where the grass is green, and you know, you take them through on these paths, and they were well-worn paths. Once you found your your circuit, if you like, you would have a, a regular way to keep your keep your sheep moving so that they would be safe from predators, right? You wouldn't put them in any dangerous situation. So it was safe to travel. Um, you would want to make sure that there weren't any dangerous precipices that would, they could push each other off or the like. Um, and then you would want to make sure that there was ample or adequate food and water resources. Like we saw, these, these green pastures and these quiet waters would be available in order to keep the flock alive as you moved them around. And so you can imagine how uh, over the years, different shepherds who learned to be shepherds from different shepherds who learned to be shepherds would have their own paths, their own little shepherd paths that they go up and, you know, as the, as the weather begins to change and summer comes on, they begin their journey and just move around through the hills, um, keeping their sheep safe and keeping their sheep fed. And so you get the idea of these well-worn paths. The Hebrew word here has the idea of a well-worn, tamped down, it's a good solid path. And this is the picture, is that we, that, that our shepherd, or um, as David speaks, David's shepherd is leading him through these well-worn paths of righteousness. And it gives a picture, I think, of the sort of repetitive nature in a positive sense of the spiritual uh, life of walking with the Lord, that you will wind up passing through various experiences, various types of uh, things time and time again, because you need to eat the grass that has grown back there and you need to drink the water as it flows through this or that uh, area and place. There's sort of a season, seasonal, maybe even cyclical nature to our spiritual growth or our walk with Christ, wherein we're going to experience, uh, again, times of rest and times of refreshing, times of movement and exercise, and, and it's all a part of the shepherd's plan and care for each of us. That's something really special. Um, and we note that it's these well-worn paths are, are, are 
righteous paths, their paths of righteousness. In fact, it's you know two Hebrew words in construct here uh, to to note that these well-worn paths are of this very special character of being righteous. And so uh, again, we see that this isn't a physical picture. This is a, a physical picture of a spiritual reality, and that those paths which He will lead us down and is leading us along are. Uh, relating to an upstanding and correctly correct relationship to God. So he's going to continue to bring us down these paths of righteousness again and again. And we find that he is uh, going to do this with the, the last clause, for his name's sake. And I love this phrase because it shows us what God's motivation, or at least part of God's motivation here. And the part of that motivation is that he himself is glorified by his care for his sheep. And you think about it, that's really not that surprising, right? I mean, if you're going to ask, is that a good shepherd? Who's going to prove, what's going to prove that he's a good shepherd? Well, that he has a good flock, right? That his flock is well cared for. And so what we find is that by caring for you, by being gracious to you and to me, by, by looking out for us in our spiritual growth and moving us through these uh, righteous paths, that the Lord's name is glorified. Have you ever thought about that? Have you thought about that the central sanctuary wherein the Lord's goodness and mercy is demonstrated is in your soul? Your life with Christ, as it as you walk through this world, is one of the main examples of God's goodness, greatness, and character. That He would take such ruined, uh, sinful wrecks as us and turn us into uh, objects of His grace instead of objects of His wrath. That we would be vessels of His love and compassion. That we would have the fruit of His Spirit coming out within us. We glorify the Lord. We declare His excellency in that, uh, in in simply being who we are as redeemed people in our in our growth, as we grow in Him, as we allow the Shepherd to care for us and submit to His care in in a positive way. It all is for His name's sake. I I uh, wanted to read just a couple of brief verses before we close on this phrase, for his name's sake. Isaiah 48, 9 says, from God speaking, for my name's sake, I will defer my anger. For my praise, I will restrain it from you so that I do not cut you off. So God's faithfulness to Israel was certainly because he's, his love for them, but it was also because he had placed his name on the success of their uh, of the completing the mission that he had for them. And though they were not always faithful and they were very seldom, you know, even very seldom we could say, uh, faithful, his name had been attached to them. And that means he took responsibility for them to care for them. He said, you're not going to fail because I put my name on you. Uh, Isaiah 48, 11, same concept for my own sake, for my own sake, that repetition, that poetic Hebrew repetition to bring emphasis for my own sake, for my own sake, I will do it. How should my name be profaned? I will not give my glory to another. Um, so we see this principle, uh, Constantly, and it's interestingly as I as you type in and look up the many references that are there for the uh, the Lord. If you just write in namesake or my namesake, you see it uh, constantly, and it's really always fascinatingly constantly attached to the mercy of God. Not always, but constantly attached to the mercy of God. Uh, Jeremiah fourteen seven. O Lord, though our iniquities testify against us, do it for Your name's sake. For our backslidings are many; we have sinned against You. You see. Um, you see that the constant plea for uh, for forgiveness, for restoration, comes because he has committed himself to us and committed us to him. And thus, it is on the basis of his name, his character, his reputation, if you like, that we can cry out in our moments of need. And he will never, even in our moments of rebellion and rejection, and he will never reject us because he has placed his name on us. His reputation's on the line, not ours. That's unique. That's something very uh, important for us to recognize and understand. And I hope you recognize that if you have trusted in Jesus Christ, then he has put his name on you. You've been branded forever. He staked his reputation on, on conforming you to the image of Jesus Christ. And while there will be difficulties along this path, along this trail, there will be ups and downs, be moments of failure and trial, for sure, he will ultimately see it done because he's put his name on it, because he's placed his name on you. 
by the person and work of his Son, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, what a wonderful gift it is to recognize, to know all that you've given us, all that you've done for us, that you've declared yourself as our shepherd and us as your sheep. Might we rest in the constant care and constant knowledge that you, our good shepherd, will not fail, that you, our good shepherd, will not um, allow us to be drawn apart or fall down so as to fall or stumble so as to fall. You, our good shepherd, are forever caring for us and looking out for us. So now, as we... Uh, Come to the close of our time of prayer and our time together, Lord. Please bless these moments that we that we've shared. May our mind constantly be restored and changed to uh, be in keeping with what you have revealed in Scripture. We praise you and thank you for all these things in Jesus' name. We pray, Amen. We please join me in uh, singing our closing hymn, "Grace Greater Than Our Sin." <laughs> of our loving Lord, grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt, yonder on Calvary's mount outpour, there where the blood of the Lamb was spilled, grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will bar Thank you for joining us for our Wednesday evening service. It's been a delight to spend some time with you, to discuss the word, to sing God's praises, and to uh, approach God in prayer. I hope that you have a wonderful week, and I hope you're able to join us tomorrow night for uh, walking through the scriptures with Sam and, um, 
And then, of course, on our Sunday morning service, right, both right here uh, at uh, Facebook or YouTube, wherever you're finding us, the Sunday morning service begins at 1030, and um, our uh, Thursday night special service will start at 730 p.m. Um, and uh, with that, we'll close our service with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for the opportunity to hear your word. We thank you for the opportunity to sing your praises. We do pray and continue to pray for all the things and all the difficulties and all the trials and all the fear that goes on in this world. And might we in this time uh, be all the more likely and all the more capable and all the more able to proclaim the joy of and wonder of knowing you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. Have a great week.